All right, looks like we're live. Um, can anyone hear us? Let's see. Can you guys hear us? All right, looks like we're live. Um, can anyone hear? Okay, perfect. Yeah, looks like everything's on. Okay, so hey everyone, um, Adnan here, and uh, I'm the content evangelist at Quixel, which means I basically help uh, producing the different videos that you guys have been seeing uh, lately on our YouTube channel. So the latest video that we did was quite a bit different from the previous ones, like. Uh, last month and part of this month as well it has been mostly unreal and uh, we really wanted to push you know real time and also see how fast um, we could not not just try out this new format of sharing tutorial tutorials with you guys doing live streams and kind of bonding you with the community almost you could say and uh, so far so good so yeah we'll keep doing just that um, so uh, today's guest is Herve Chop. He's from Croatia and he's one of the most amazing guys out there. Uh, that's why I'm really excited to have this uh, live stream. So before we get started, uh, just a quick uh, recap. Last week we published a video that showed you how to create um, an Archvis scene within um, 3ds Max and Corona. Let me just open that one right here. I think I have like Chrome and Firefox open and it messes up on my computer all over. Let's see. Yep, it was this one. So the reception for this video was really amazing and uh, we're really happy that, you know, you guys liked it. And a lot of people have been making some really nice um, kind of variations or homages of this scene. Uh, this one is from Martin Bumans. Um, like this was actually rendered in Lightwave and Octane and when I saw Lightwave I was like really Lightwave that's that's like you know it's like hearing Modo and so on it's one of those amazing softwares that you don't get to hear from that often but that are just really really great so yeah fantastic job and really original idea I just wish like everything was gold <laughs> even the light particles were gold maybe and uh, the other one is actually real time and this one is just a beast in unity from em tibet um, i tried to find your name on your channel but couldn't uh, i usually recommend people actually if you do publish your work always add a an art station or whatever link in your description because you never know who might find you you know and tell you hey here's a job do you want to take it so yeah this is just wonderful and it really shows that you know real time and offline rendering are closer than ever closer together than ever before and uh yeah this is just great and this is actually a good segue into talking about an event that is happening in italy next week so they have this event called soa state of the art uh, is it State of Art Academy or something like that? Uh, the name, I always keep forgetting it. So it's happening in Venice and there's gonna be a few workshops. I'll be there doing a workshop on this scene, but in Unreal Engine. So I'll show you, you know, like, okay, this scene looks great in offline rendering. Now let's see how it's gonna, how's it gonna work with ray tracing and other features um, like that. So yeah, if you're in Italy, uh, please come by and we'll have a drink or whatever. I have a few days there, so should be fun. Uh, I've never been there, so. And uh, I'm also gonna be hosting, I'm not sure if it's gonna be Friday next week or Friday the week after, depending on the internet in Italy, but I hope to host a live stream of that same workshop as well, where I'll be showing you guys how this scene can be made in real time um, as well. Uh, let me just go to live chat over here. Yes, and uh, yeah, back to Poly Machine, uh, which uh, Chop, the guy who made the scene, is the CTO of. You should definitely visit 
their website they like it's the mo it's the trippiest website i've seen in a long time like you just hover here bam and uh yeah a really nice website with a lot of really great um, work here actually this scene right here we did a tutorial on it a few months ago i think it was in june 6th of june yes and uh, yeah again you should watch it he, he explains all the process uh, here of how he did all the details you know the lighting and so on so that's pretty interesting um so the last one that i wanted to showcase was this article from 80 level that i'm gonna post in the youtube chat over here um i definitely recommend this because it's made by an amazing studio and yeah it's just a full breakdown into how they use mega scans and mixer and unreal to create this really amazing scene and their process is just amazing so yeah i think that's it now i'm gonna give the mic to head of the shop who is gonna be talking about this amazing scene All right back to you oh hello there so hi everyone this is actually my first live stream ever so don't judge me too harshly <laughs> uh so first of all i have to apologize for my mouse it's uh, for some unknown technical reason it's been lagging like crazy all the time so i'll try to keep it moving really slowly so that you guys can actually figure out what's going on and from what I see right now, uh, it seems also to be like offset. It's amazing technology these days, right? Uh, <laughs> so, Adnan, can you please confirm this because my no, pointer actually, seems to be. I think it's actually it's actually good. Uh, it's actually good. So it's on can... the box button. Uh, right now, I think it oh, should no. be on the box button right now. It it does have a slight offset somehow. Yeah, that is definitely yeah. strange. That's weird, but I can see where it is. So right now, from what I see in the live stream, it's on the box button right now. So yeah, yeah, I think it should yeah, be good. I can, so you can I can actually ahead. move it because yeah, I'm seeing the live stream. So I'll try to point you guys in the right direction. I'm really sorry about this, but you know, every time like two minutes to midnight, something like this happens, but we didn't want to keep you waiting any longer. Right, so you've probably all seen the scene as it was on in the tutorial. And it was funny because uh, when the guys from Quixel first asked me to do this, I was, uh, well, I haven't done any video tutorials before either. So that was new as well. So we tried to pack like a bunch of info into not a lot of minutes. I think this one was all of 13 minutes long, something like this. So obviously you can't really explain everything, but we tried. So I hope you guys got some useful content out of it and info, but we're going to use this stream to kind of go through anything that you might be, you know, uh, interested in, or if you have any specific questions and stuff like that, but let's just go uh, through the scene as it is right now. Okay. So basically, I mean, this is probably the simplest scene I've ever published geometry wise because it's uh what it's all of 13 objects right so 13 objects two lights this is pretty much all we have and somebody on youtube was asking about um the light setup or i think it was instagram maybe or something but as you can see there is really nothing to it and if we look at uh, my environment options we just have a default corona sky so the last tutorial we did was um, done in v-ray so we chose corona for this one and i think it turned out pretty well because you can tell how extremely simple all of this is it's it's really nothing too complicated so basically all we did was um, create a default like skylight environment which in Corona, it's actually automatic. So as soon as you create a sun, you get this nice button, which adds your Corona sky environment. So you don't have to even open this window. And so a sun, a sky, and just one light from the top so that we push some light in through the ceiling. And yeah, and we have a little like geometry light over here, which basically kind of just 
shines a bit of light on the floor, right? So, um, yeah, that that's pretty much you know that pretty much sums it up. So we we made a few boxes, imported some Megascan statues, which I really like. I said that in the tutorial as well. I think these scans are absolutely fantastic. Yeah, <laughs> and. I I suppose they were really hard to do. I can't even imagine how many photos you guys had to take to, to you know, make these. But I'm happy you did and not me. <laughs> Definitely. We have actually a question from Lost with Dan. Uh, hey, Lost with Dan. Uh, always great to see in the live stream. So his question is, what's the purpose of using 3ds Max over another software like, say, Unreal, so Unreal or Unity or even V-Ray? Uh, so um, yeah, okay. I you mean, want to let me do that one? Um, I'll just briefly give him like a brief answer, and then I'll let sure. you expand on the you know choosing the right render. So generally, if you compare this tutorial to the other ones that we've published, this is like geared to the ArchViz industry, which is currently going more and more towards real-time rendering with something like Unreal. However. Um, the quality that offline renders offer you is still unmatched. Like when you look at the tutorial, for instance, he's just placing one light and the whole thing is done. And that's really what's happening. Uh, if you had to do this with a real time software, like it, it's now way faster and way better with tools like ray tracing and so on. But it's just like offline um, gives you that extra edge of realism that is it you can attain it with real time but it's quite hard uh, unless you really know what you're doing but uh, i'd love to hear, hear your thoughts actually uh chop on if you had to do this scene in v-ray versus i don't know corona what do you think could be like some basic pros and cons between both of them in terms of speed to render this scene well you know we're one of the studios that use both so render wise we use both v-ray and corona and i think they both have their distinct like, pros and cons for every project so basically what we do is when we start a project we kind of um, try to figure out which render render en engine we're going to use and usually it goes like this so if it's um if it's something that we have to nail like a specific look but the project is not too complex we'll probably use corona because for look development, for various reasons, like uh, some UI things, it's it it's a bit nicer to work with when you're just you know concerned about the looks of something. And um, I'll I'll be showing you that at some point the way Corona's frame buffer works and the real time like interactive. I mean, it's not real time obviously, but the interactive preview, the way it works in Corona, I kind of like using that for for look development. V-Ray, on the other hand, is like this beast of a render engine, which can, you know, anything you throw at V-Ray, it's going to render out. There's no question. So <laughs> it's insanely robust because it's been, you know, a staple of the industry for so long. And production wise, I think its feature set is unmatched in any render engine. And it's compatible with everything. So, you know, whatever happens, it first gets compatible with V-Ray than everything else. Yeah. So it's you know it's really a proven solution so every time we have something like really really complex or huge we're probably going to use v-ray because then we don't have to even think if it's going to render or you know if it's going to fit in memory if it's it's just probably going to work so yeah. that's the point where we choose v-ray mm -hmm. and from then on it's mostly to everybody in the company you know whoever is doing the images they kind of decide on their own which render engine to use on a specific project so but we really love both it's i think they're together they are like a perfect combo for archviz and um just to add in actually if you're using unreal for instance you can use v-ray within unreal they have this nice live link plugin where you could make your scene with your lights and everything within um v-ray in 3ds max and then you just transfer the project in unreal engine um, that gives you, I guess, you know, Unreal's fairly simple uh, cinematic controls, you know, the camera. You can also, I think, leverage the different effects there and also almost kind of merge 
both your Unreal assets and your 3ds Max assets and have it happen in real time be able to tweak things like you would in a game engine and so on so yeah it's like the industry is really trying to move into real time and I think that's kind of a mid step but yeah it's already a pretty big uh, step um, so I think um, one thing that basically the geometry is fairly simple here however I'd like us to cover a little bit the UVs and uh, yeah just hear from you know like what kind of tips and tricks did you use to get the UVs right you know get the edges uh, of the uh, of the wall where you have you have those angles to intersect right at the edges of your kind of texture as well and so oh sure yeah that's i believe that's an interesting one so anybody who's seen the video has you know you've seen a bit of it obviously how it works but so let's just focus on this wall a bit and i'll show you so in the slate material editor so uh, if you're using max you have the option of like the slate editor or the old one it's called the compact editor and i know there's a lot of people still kind of using the compact editor but honestly you know in my professional opinion you shouldn't be because slate is like such a huge advancement to the way you can you know modify materials and you can make shader trees which are so much more complex and it's so much easier to navigate but there's a there's a few tips and tricks like when using slate which a lot of people don't know and it can really help you you know uh, do things faster so i think i may before the whole uv thing maybe go through this a bit i think that that would be nice for sure yeah so basically you know sometimes what's going to happen is that you're going to create a material or something and you'll probably have some maps and maybe you know just maybe let's just make any map like a noise for example and you'll have this map plugged into many places so what i've seen people do usually in in slate is what happens when you want to change this to a different map so you would need to what people usually do is this right they take the map and they plug it all into all of the necessary slots and that's obviously quite irritating and takes a lot of time but you could what you can do is actually pick your new map and just plug it on the output of the old one and it's going to get remapped to everything you need right uh -huh. so that's a super useful tip and i don't really see many people using it yeah and I just, another thing i never heard about it <laughs> yes most people haven't because i don't think it's really well documented but it's just you know max <laughs> yeah <laughs> so another one is if you move your material it's obviously quite messy to you know select everything move it around and stuff like that especially once your node trees become like really really complicated but again what you can do is hold control and alt and then when you move anything on top anything behind it will move with it so all the child nodes are going to move with it okay wow so, <laughs> Yeah, these are these are just, you know, some of the some of the really cool tricks. And what I also mentioned in both of my videos, I think, is so if you go to material, there's this get from selected option, right? And by default, this is not bound to any uh, key. And you can tell I have it bound on control G. Mm -hmm. So what happens there is let's say, I don't know, uh, let's say I don't, let's remove this because we don't need that. Let's say I don't have this walls material at all in my editor, right? But I need to see it or work on it. Um, can, can you go in full just... screen actually for this uh, window? Uh, some people oh, because I need, that they I need my Max. Just give me a second. So okay. if I select my walls and go to slate and now I press control G, it's just gonna appear here, okay? So, the, but the funny thing that happens with this, if this material is already inside the editor and I'm working on something completely different, if I have my walls selected and I press control G again, it's gonna move your screen to where the material is. And that way, you know, especially if you have like a dual monitor setup or something, you can like really, really quickly move towards the materials and you don't really have to care 
you know, where exactly in your uh, shader trees they, they are, right? Because you can just select the objects that you need, go back, and it's gonna point you right to it. So yeah, these are just some very, very simple tips, you know, how to use Slate more efficiently. And also one thing you probably, well, some of you probably don't know, uh, there's this thing here called the, uh, wait a second, where is it? Options, tools, oh, the material map browser. And it's here on the left. So this you wanna turn off, trust me, because um, it kind of slows down your whole slate editor a lot. So just use the right click menu to create your materials because the whole like interface is gonna work much, much faster. And yeah, and a final thing, uh, so this little icon in the bottom right here that says rendering finished, if you turn this off, it's gonna stop rendering all of your materials. So suddenly, yeah, my I know my uh, screen is lagging a bit, but the frame rates like off your editor are gonna increase like tenfold. So, because it's not doing updates anymore. And then if you want to see any specific material, you can just manually update a preview. So you can kind of pick and choose what you want to look at at some point. And there's, you know, if at any given point you want to see all of them, you can just turn this back on and it's going to start rendering all of them again. So yeah, these are just, you know, some of the, some of the cool little tricks that I wanted to share. And also, yes, a lot of people forget that you can create new views. Let's call it, I don't know, new materials and just have it empty so that basically you can segment all of your materials into different tabs. And then you don't have a tab which has like 150 materials in it, which will make both, you know, the navigation and the usage so, so much faster. Mm, yeah, I think that's that pretty much covers the Slate editor. Yep, perfect. All right, now it's UV time. Yeah, now it's UV time. Okay, so let's just select these walls. Okay. And let me just turn off um, the viewport background here because it's a bit distracting. This is actually in the latest Max 2020.2. This is the new default. So if you have any kind of environment, it's gonna automatically appear in your perspective views, which is not something you may want all the time. But, okay, so if you look at this, I mean, geometry wise, again, it's like really super simple. And we have our UVW unwrap modifier. I'm just gonna turn this one off. Uh, so we use this to kind of fix our texture to exactly where we wanted it. And a really cool thing that happens when you're doing ArcVis. So when you're, I mean, when you're doing mostly anything which is like 3ds Max specific or even Maya or something like that. So we're not baking anything, right? And this means we can like really, really do all sorts of dirty cheats and tricks with UVs because first of all, we don't have to care if they fit inside the zero to one UV space, which, you know, I'm sure Adnan, you're very familiar with this yeah. <laughs> in Unreal or any real time engine, you really want your UVs to, you know, all be inside and then have some bake maps or something that you're going to put on. But as you can tell, you know, our wall segments are right here and they're absolutely huge and they're nowhere near the zero to one point space, right? So let's, uh, if you want, I could just like delete this actually and do it from scratch again, just to show the whole process, right? Yes, please. So let's just, let's just remove this one and we'll add another one. And there's a really cool, okay, this is, yeah, it takes a bit of, to load the Oh, where are you? Okay. Unwrap, unwrap UV. Okay. So, yes, I do. Ah, uh, there we are. So basically what we have right now is nowhere close to where we want to be. I'm just going to come back to my material editor and reset what I'm actually seeing here. So control G again, 
let's move to this material. And what I want to see is the default bitmap. Okay, that's the one. Let's remove this. Okay, so as you can tell, you know, this is nowhere near what we want. And the green lines here are actually the seams in the UVs. So if we look at our editor again, we're going to see that it doesn't really look like much. But if we, so this little button, when you turn this switch on, it will select like an entire element of your mesh. And an element is basically anything that is welded together. And well, 3ds Max being 3ds Max, uh, this button also selects elements, but UV elements, which don't really have to correspond with your mesh elements. So even though our mesh is all welded together, you can see there's a UV seam here. So basically we have two UV elements. So if you try and pick that, it will actually detach the part without the seam, right? So first of all, we need to connect all of this. And you could do it in a number of ways, but the absolute fastest way to weld all the, UV, all the UVs of some object is to select everything you want to weld and just apply a simple planar map to it. Of course, it's going to ruin everything, so this really doesn't look like much. But right now, you can tell that we have no seams other than the external ones where they should be. So approaching, you know, somehow, in some way, we have to flatten this, obviously. And once again, you can do that in any number of ways. But usually, you know, there's an option called flatten mapping. You can try using that one. And right now, what it did is it created some more seams here because this is kind of a too big of an angle for it to detect, right? But if we try and increase that, let's say, I don't know, 90 would be good, maybe. Okay, so now it's all flat and we have no seams. But obviously, if you look at this, it doesn't really look the way it's supposed to, and we have some seriously bad stretching here. So that means generally that we have to somehow force this mesh to look like this mesh. And one of the ways to do that is by relaxing. So there's many relaxing algorithms out there, but Max has like relaxed by polygon angles and relaxed by edge angles. And going into the specifics of how these work is way too obscure for the scope of this tutorial. But let's just say, you know, if you start relaxing things, you'll get, you know, with simple shapes like these, it's probably going to get to a point where it looks proper really fast. But as you can tell, there's still a lot of stretching here. So our dimensions are not really correct. So let's just do a few more of these. And right now, I think it's all good. So for those of you who are not really deep into texturing and UV mapping, uh, this is actually called texel density. So the amount of texture points that you have in any specific um, area of surface, right? So what we want to do at all times is basically keep the texture density or texel density as it's called the same on all the objects. And that's why we use these relaxing algorithms, which will then kind of try to so there's, there's a thing called area distortion and angle distortion. If you turn these on, you will see that we have no distortion right now. That means all our surfaces are kind of perfectly flat and that our texture kind of looks the way it should. Now, obviously, this isn't exactly what we want. So let's just go back to this to, no, where is it? Where is it? OK, reset texture list. Um, <laughs> I need my map. Oh, there's our map. OK, so what we want to do, like we said, is kind of align all of these edges to the edges of the texture itself. And since this particular Megascan assets, it, asset is um, like a big concrete slab, it has edges like on the very edge of the texture. So what we want to do is we want to align these lines to where the grouts in the concrete are. So first of all, our object is rotated wrong. So we're just going to rotate it a bit. Wait, let me do this. OK, rotate. Oh, wonderful. I have no gizmo. Wait a second. 
I think that's because of the streaming. I'm sorry about that, but I have no tool to use. Uh, but anyway, so we can align the texture like this, but obviously it's way, way too huge for now, which means we have to scale our object up. So if we start scaling it, let me just shrink this a bit so you can see both sides. As we scale the object up, the texture obviously scales down, right? So the way I did it in, in the video was I used this first wall as a reference. So I've kind of, you know, manually scaled it around until I got it to a point where it kind of hits two of these slabs, right? Kind of. We don't have to be super accurate at this point. So it's kind of close to where we want to be. Yeah. So just by using move, rotate, scale, that's that's all there is to it. Yes. And then we can get like down and dirty with the sub-objects and just move them around slightly until we hit it on the head. So the way you do this, and by the way, uh, this is a great point to tell you about one of the most useful tips and tricks I've ever heard in 3ds Max, ever, and it concerns the UV editor. So uh, there's a, it's kind of like a bug, and it has been here for at least 10 years. So when you select, um, you're going to run into it eventually. So if you select like a bunch of polygons or something, and if you press, for example, any of these like default maps, like planar, box, whatever, let's just do a planar. At this point, it will not let you select anything else, as you can see. So the selection will just kind of die on you. So people used to close the UV editor and then open it back up to kind of get the selection working. But all you need to do is actually change sub-object levels. And you can do it with uh, the numbers one, two, three. So one is vertex, two is edges, three is surfaces So, or faces. So if you just press two and three, back and it's working. So this will save you like hours of time uh, once you get to it. Oh, let me just switch to my keyboard. OK, let's undo this. I just wanted to share that one quickly. So yeah, coming back to this. If we want to nail, you know, the texture towards all the corners, all we need to do at this point is just select, oh, we have to turn off the elements. We have to select a specific edge and just move it until it kind of fits where we want it to be. So if I start moving it around, I think it's this one, we'll see that the texture stretches accordingly. And you can hold down shift to keep the motion orthogonal, right? So just left, right, or just up, down. Now, it's kind of hard, you know, to really hit it perfectly. But OK, well, that was lucky. <laughs> but the, the cool thing is the more you zoom in in the UV editor, the more resolution you actually get for moving the texture around. So you can zoom in like really, really, really hard and you can tell how this much motion of the mouse moves the image like for one pixel. So we have a question actually here. And sure. um, since we, yes, I'm glad that we just covered this part of, you know, kind of making sure that we get the uh, edges well aligned. So the question is best program to start learning 3D modeling? I think this is not a question. This is a call to war. <laughs> oh, no, no, no. I don't, I don't think it is. <laughs> no, I'm I don't joking. think it is. It's, uh, I think, in the end, you know, well, I kind of have a whole podcast episode about that. But it's, um, it's basically, first, you have to think what you plan on, you know, doing later. Because there's so many avenues in 3D you can explore and so many different jobs that you know beginning with this software or that other software can really influence you know how you do things for example archviz what we do is i would dare say it's like 90 percent 3ds max so definitely if you you know if you're looking for a career in archviz you might want to be 
immediately starting with 3ds max yeah if you're doing indie games and stuff like that a lot of those use blender right so blender is a great start for that because then you have a quite a good chance to you know get a job in a specific studio because you'll already be using the software that they use uh, same thing for animation in maya or vfx and houdini so you know every software has really a specific use where it's let's say most popular so basically first identify the industry that you want to be working in and then kind of start with something yeah and i think just to add in and also kind of have a segue into giving you a quick trick into you know the uv in question in uh, maya so in general a lot of people learn how to model in a 3d software however it's really important to learn how to model full stop like yes <laughs> modeling in general is such a simple principle but if you learn how to extrude or how to if you learn what an inset is for instance only in modo in modo i think an extrude is actually an inset and in max they have a, a tool called inset and in maya they have extrude however um, I actually have Maya here open. So if I selected this face and did an extrude, you can actually control the offset. So that's how it's called in uh, Maya. So it's really important to kind of know, you know, okay, this feature, what it does is that it just insets a face. So wherever you go, always search, you know, what's the equivalent, uh, not as in the same name. Like a lot of people, when, they go, when they're when they learning Blender, they go like, oh, I wish Blender had this great feature in 3ds Max or in something, something like, don't do that. Just look for general principles and then you're gonna be, you're bound to discover a lot of great features. Um, in general um, so uh, the the quick tip about UVing in Maya I'm gonna open the UV editor and let's hope that Maya doesn't crash <laughs> uh, Maya you're gonna love it sometimes yes so one thing that a lot of people don't know about is that you can actually select an edge in Maya and move it without affecting the UV so right now as you can see I'm affecting the UVs you know they're following the structure and it's deforming the whole thing however if you control right click uh, control shift yes if you control shift right click you have this option preserve uvs so you just release your mouse on it now you can move your edge and your uvs won't be um, affected this is really useful if you wanted to align um, let me just select these two vertices right here so Actually, no, I can just move this edge and there you go. Yeah, this can be useful, you know, maybe later on you want to split your whole uh, structure or something. So you can just place something like this and then have another loop in the middle, select all your um, faces and follow, you know, kind of the structure of those shapes. Uh, obviously you're gonna need to tweak your UV slightly, but this gives you an idea of, you know, how easy it is to actually get certain details. Uh, this, you can just, I think, apply and unfold and it'll fix it. But yeah, uh, this, you know, it's just principles. And actually this feature, I discovered it in school with 3ds Max, you know, like basic editing and kind of coordinating it with UVs and so on. So yes, uh, I think that's it here. Let me just double check the questions anything about bridge live link update for 4.23 so um 4.23 was supposed to be released this week like we said last week uh, unfortunately yeah we just need a little bit more time to queue it and make sure that whatever we give you guys is the best version out there so it's in the works and yeah uh, let me just read the other one Okay, can you share the article about Mega Scans and Unreal in the beginning? Um, yes, for sure. Let me drop that in the comment right here. Best program to start modeling is drawing. Um, I don't necessarily agree there because a lot of fantastic, I mean, I think if you're an artist, if you call yourself an artist, whether you, even if you're just doing hard surface stuff, you should definitely learn how to draw like I, I agree on that however 
a lot of people that you admire in this industry probably don't know nothing about drawing they just know how to manipulate uh, polygons um, so last question before I give you back the mic chop will you show this same tutorial in Unreal uh, yes probably on Friday next week if the internet in Italy is good or Friday the week after but I'm gonna be reconstructing the whole scene for Unreal live with you guys where you can ask questions give suggestions and so on so uh, yeah all right um, back to you and I think now we can actually cover you know a little bit of your lighting setup and see the different comparisons between you know like Okay, when you have oh, sure. displacement, yeah. how does it look like, and so on. We have, yeah. I think we have. I think we covered minutes. the basics. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, we have twenty minutes, so that we covered the basics of this. Okay, so let's let's not you know waste too much time on this. But basically, you know, this one little edge that we moved, you just do this process all over again, and that's yeah. it, right? <laughs> yeah. So there's nothing nothing really magical about this. Uh, you just need to select stuff and move it around, right? So. Just so we don't have an ugly uh, looking texture here, I'm going to quickly put this into place. Just like this. Okay. And yeah, let's move this one too. Okay, let's say this is good enough for now, right? Okay. So let's get back to to all of this that we have, okay? So if you look at it let's turn these both off for now and just use the skylight so if we come back to our camera and fire up a quick preview this is not going to take long fingers crossed <laughs> oh no where are your cores now <laughs> Oh, they're they're there. <laughs> okay, yeah. so if you know you can see that okay, let's get rid of this one for the time being. Okay, where is it? Line 03. Yeah, that's the one. We don't need that one. Okay, so this is just basically the skylight component. And when you're working with lights, I mean obviously this is this is like a really, really super simple setup, as you'll see. But when you're working with lights, it's kind of always a good point to do it one by one and kind of look at previews in the meantime, because then you can really judge, you know, what's going on with your scene and, you know, is there enough light coming from each individual source and how it's actually contributing to your final image, right? And this was, you know, for the skylight, this was pretty cool. So we said, okay, you know, this, this looks like a good start, but we wanted to get some light action on the walls and some, you know, splotches of light and stuff like that. So we added up a sun, right? So in Max, if you press H, you'll get this select by name uh, dialog and we can just pick the sun from there. Um, we have and a question. Is it rendering sure. with the GPU or this? No, no, no. Corona, Corona is a CPU renderer. So we, I mean, as a company, we don't really do GPU rendering. And there's a few reasons for that. And that's, you know, a lot of people keep asking about these things. So basically the GPU, GPUs are awesome, right? They are ridiculously fast and they have a lot of, you know, a lot of advantages because of this insane rendering speed you get, but also they're very limited in memory. So basically it boils down to, you know, what kind of scenes are you making? Sometimes, you know, in architecture, your scenes can get like really, really large, especially exteriors with a lot of forests and stuff like that. So uh, because of certain reasons, like we don't really do a lot of post as as a company outside of what you can find the, in the frame buffer, right? So for us, you know, using cutouts and stuff like that, it's not really an option. We don't, we don't like doing that. And once you start doing everything in 3D, you tend to spend like a lot of RAM so with CPUs, it's so much easier to expand your memory and stuff like that. And the other, the other part is, you know, whenever a new technology comes out or a new plugin or something, it usually first gets ported to all the CPU engines, then to the GPU engines. 
and we really like new stuff and I hate to wait on stuff to be compatible. So that's another reason, obviously. And, you know, CPU renders can be really cool because you don't have to optimize things like uh, textures and geometry wise, because most of the time you can just shove, you know, an almost unlimited amount of geometry and textures inside and never care about, you know, is it the right size? Is it, you know, oh, this object is very far away, so I'm not gonna use a 4K map on it. We can just use 4K maps on everything. So depending on your work personal like workflow, sometimes that's a great thing and sometimes it's not a great thing. So it all kind of depends on you know, how any individual works, right? But yeah, Corona is a CPU. They call themselves a proudly CPU based. I think that's an official term. So uh, yeah, let's just uh, go back to the lighting part. So if we turn on our sun, you're gonna see that, you know, we immediately start getting some really nice, you know, light splotches in here. It's kind of, you know, making the whole scene a bit better. And what we did is we increased the size of the sun because on like, this is like the regular physically accurate sun size. And, you know, we did some art direction on this and we kind of concluded that, you know, it's, it looks a bit more fun when it's a bit softer. So you just increase the size of the sun. It kind of simulates the way sun would shine through a cloud or something like that. So it becomes a bit softer. And if you look here, you'll see that the intensity of the sun is 0 0.3. So we kind of lowered the intensity of the sun, which is not photorealistic by default. You shouldn't be kind of doing it unless you know why you're doing it. So basically, in like a completely pho photorealistic situation, our sun would look like this, right? And it's quite strong. It doesn't, you know, now when I look at it, it doesn't even look bad. It's pretty cool. But I don't even know why we did it that way. But, uh, you know, if we go back and kind of lower it down a bit, the whole scene kind of, you know, just dims a little. And then we can just kind of add, let's select our other light. Yeah, which is the ceiling light. Let me just remove this for a second. So we put it somewhere on here. And you know, the bigger your light source is, the softer the shadows will be, obviously. So we made it quite large. And if we turn that on, now we're kind of pushing a bit of this light into, into the space from above. Just to kind of put an emphasis on these statues, we wanted this interior part to look a bit darker and you know just shine a light on these statues and this kind of setup it's you know this is a matter of a lot of discussions because there's there's people who advocate like uh, you shouldn't be lowering the sun because it's not realistic and stuff like that well yes to a point but also you know i think the ends justify the means so you can light this scene in a million different ways and it's as long as it looks good in the end it's probably a good way to light it. So sometimes, especially for like very, very simple tutorials like this, it makes so much more sense to just nail the relative power of your lights instead of keeping everything, you know, super physically accurate. Because in ArcVis especially, uh, there's like real reality, which is what you see in the world around you. And there's the expected reality of what you're supposed to be doing, right? And those things are rarely the same thing because in real life, nothing is really perfect. Everything is a bit dirty and a bit jagged and a bit something. And 99% of you know architectural clients don't really want that. They want the perfect version of their project, which is obviously unrealistic by default. So it's, you know, you need to sometimes find a balance between those two points. But yeah, let's not dwell on that. <laughs> we As actually you can see, have a question basically. here. Yeah, sure. Um, so, Amin Najafi asked earlier, you know, what were uh, what were the specs of the computer? I just told him that, you know, like it's a work computer. And then he said, is it possible to reach such quality with a, a personal, you know, like just your guy, random guy computer? Um, I of think course. That's actually yeah. 
definitely possible and uh, one way of dealing with that you know when you're importing with a live link or something or even when you're importing stuff manually you can always just in a disable sorry uh, displacement maps so if you have um, let's open this software in a second let's see yes I'm starting a bridge basically if you're importing a any assets in uh, Max or any other renderer, uh, people often love to have you know like the, the most expensive displacement map using the high poly just because it's offline. But that's not needed in this case. In most cases, I think you can get away with something like you know uh, the um, lot zero and the normal, or just going with the high uh, without any displacement though. If you're doing a final render that is going to the client, and if you know that. Uh, the render is going to benefit even if it's just slightly from the displacement then you can add that you know in your final render however while just testing things out there is no need to just disable displacement render maybe in 720p and you should be good to go and um, can you actually do you still have that comparison uh, chop with the with and without Oh, with and without no but I can actually zoom in and into a part and show it okay. uh, as it looks so let's just do that quickly okay I'll bring back my oh <clears throat> okay let's pick I don't know this for example so if we come back here and render this out. Okay, we're gonna have to wait for a second here until it starts. Yeah. Okay, so there's a really nifty feature in Corona. So if you zoom in in the frame buffer, it's gonna automatically region the render just to what you zoom into. Now this may not, this map may not be the perfect example of you know what's gonna happen. But let's just render out quickly a part of this um, crease in the concrete. Okay, we're gonna save that. And then we're gonna turn on our displacement modifier. And we're gonna render it again. Okay, just going through this very quickly. This zoom to region function is insanely useful when you're, you know, really zooming into your materials and stuff because you don't really have to wait for the rest of the image to finish. Okay, let's store this one as well. So, if you look at a comparison, I don't think you're gonna see much of a difference here because the normal maps on this asset well and most of the assets from the mega scans i have to say are so good that most of the time you can just get away with using normal maps and this will increase your render speed tremendously but also you know when you turn displacement on and you can really see that here let me zoom in to this a bit so this little highlight that appears here it's a very subtle effect i don't know if it shows properly on your screens i hope it does it's yep. really 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 minimal but in like extreme close-ups and in certain lighting scenarios this thing will make the world of a difference sometimes in the way you know you experience the whole image like for example if you look at the width displacement and without so there's this little shadow here going on because it's now it's an actual hole in the geometry so it's the little things like this, you know, for final images, I think on certain materials, depending on the scenario and setup, you might want to use them because you're going to be, you know, the result isn't like drastically different. If you look at this hole, for example, then we go back, you know, you can just tell that there's a bit more shadow here. So it can accentuate some, some very, very tiny details sometimes, but it's like super memory intensive. So you should be you should use it sparingly only where you need it. Yeah, and uh, we have a question here. Let me just go back to it in a second. 
how um would you recommend to work with how would you recommend to work with large scenes like a forest on normal mainstream gaming computers it, that's actually a good question and i'm gonna expand on that let's say you are chop from you know like 10 years ago or something you know you you don't have this beast of a computer <laughs> just yet and you you need to render a forest do you have any tips and tricks that could help you with your personal computer uh, render things faster if you are doing a forest like do you feel like rendering you know uh, for trees do you feel like rendering alpha cards versus just geometry which one would be faster you know just quick summary of some tips and tricks on that oh sure so uh the funny thing about trees so we render a lot of trees uh the very funny thing most people i think don't know is that geometry actually renders way faster than opacity map leaves mm -hmm. so it's actually faster to render a tree which has like modeled leaves than to render a tree with leaves that are planes and just have like opacity maps on them. And that's because of the nature of the rendering equation, which actually has to trace, you know, the transparency of every pixel through that leaf and interpolate the bitmap and stuff like that. But this also means that you have to fit this ge geometry tree into your PC memory somehow. So unfortunately, I mean, it's all possible, right? The, the biggest difference in, you know, rendering with like a massive workstation like this and just your regular, you know, kind of gamer PC is obviously time. This is going to render faster, right? But it also assumes that you have enough RAM to fit things in. Now, what can help you there, first of all, are proxies. So these are actually proxy objects, which I just... Uh, put into full mesh display so that we can see them better. But the way 3ds Max sees them is just, you know, like this. So basically they don't get saved with your scene. They're saved externally and they just get loaded at render time, which really helps a lot with like auto saves because these three statues alone have like a gigabyte, I think, or something like that. So we really don't want to save this every time we save or auto save that's why we proxy them out now every render engine has its own system of proxies in every software so whether it's max or maya or whatever it is so basically you really want to leverage this uh, as much as you can and especially if you combine this with instances so you basically you can instance one of your proxies as many times as you want so this just turned into like a hundred million polygons, but you know, uh, my viewport, yeah, the stream is lagging, but my viewport is like, you can tell it's like almost 200 frames per second. So it's like nothing happened. And of all these statues, only one will take up RAM space because all of the others are instances. So kind of combining these two things will let you render much bigger scenes than you might be able to if you're just brute forcing everything. And the other vital part is an instancing plugin. So in Max, we use Forest Pack mostly. There's also Multiscatter. I, I have no idea what people in Maya use, but you should know, Adnan. Actually, in Maya, they have this tool called Mash that almost no one uses. Um, oh, but Mesh, I, yeah, yeah. Yes, uh, the guys from uh, Mainframe, like they do amazing animations and uh, you guys should definitely, I mean, it's almost discriminated in Maya because by default the plugin is disabled. So you need to go into like your settings, uh, plugin ma manager, and then you just type in Mesh. And yeah, you should enable it and it's, just amazing um, we had a question here let me go back to it when you use displacement maps are you changing the values by default um, so I guess this is more like a general mega scans ecosystem question I think it it depends like kind of 50 50 because displacement maps are probably the stranger strangest and most uncommon textures out there um, all softwares handle them differently and therefore in most cases if you import a displacement in Marmoset Toolbag, Unreal and V-Ray chances are you're not gonna get them right by default I mean 
they're gonna look good but you know maybe you're gonna get like the offset oh it's five i just need to set it to two or oh it's two i just need to set it to five or to 0 0.05 uh, like there are so many variables that uh, come into account like you know what's your scene unit what's the size of your object did you scale your object when you scaled your object did you freeze transform it or reset x for in uh, 3ds max so it's complicated but every other map usually is just drag and drop and done um, the other question is is there a way to mix between using unwrap UVW and UVW map in real world scale? Uh, I guess this is for um, you, Chuck. Yeah. So, okay. Uh, mixing UV maps, we actually have a good example right here. Uh, so, if we look at our preview again, so these walls in the original image, they have these sort of dark leaks going on, like water dripping from above. And this is this UV modifier. And if we're lucky, they should appear. And yes, they are here. So we obviously didn't unwrap this because um, the thing is that you just need a different mapping channel, right? To In order to layer these things. So let me just quickly show you how it looks in the actual material, right? So if we go here, this is our basic concrete texture from Megascans and it's set to map channel one, right? And this is the imperfection texture we also imported from Megascans, and that one is set to uh, mapping channel two. Oh, so um, what actually, you wanna do one in sec. Max... Can you oh, can you go in full screen in the slate material editor? Cause oh, I, absolutely. Yeah, yeah, I promised yeah, yeah. one guy that we would zoom just so he can see the nodes. No, oh, yeah, absolutely. I mean, the material itself is basically just what you get from the mega scans. We just added these leaks. And if you look at it a bit more closely, you can see there's a Corona mix map here. And every render engine has their own version of a mix map. And also in any uh, 3D software that support OSL, you can use like an OSL mix map. You could probably find some online for free and they are render engine agnostic for the most part. So you can use them instead. So basically Corona Mix mixes two textures based on a mask, which in this case is a gradient. And our gradient map is also set to channel two. And I'm gonna go back here. Oh, wait a sec. Let me just remove these. So if we look at our second channel, you can tell that this UV, it's just a regular UV map. It's a box map, and it's also set to uh, channel two, which means that our main concrete texture is going to use the unwrap, and the other textures that we assign are going to use this regular box map thing. So if we isolate this and take a look around, you're going to see that it's just like a big box map. So let me just show you how this looks. So these are actually our leaks, right? And they respond to our box map. And they have nothing to do with the unwrap modifier. And our gradient map is also box mapped. So basically we're masking out the leaks so that where the areas of the gradient are darker, we're going to have less of this leakage showing up, right? And with just, you know, I think this is a very, very simple way of layering textures to get an end result, you know, which looks really, really cool, right? Yeah. I think and we're... as for the real world, uh, yeah, before I forget about that, mm -hmm. so real world mapping is nothing more than uh, basically inputting your texture size uh, inside the uh, material editor, right? So if we click on real world, where is it? I always forget. Okay, real world scale. So instead of tiling, you get centimeters. But if you have tiling, then basically your centimeters are in the modifier instead of on the map, right? So that's the only difference. The mapping is still the same. It's not different in any way. Uh, only the place where you actually input the numbers changes. 
which is for architecture sometimes really nice because you can change it on one map and then that map is going to apply the same way to every object you have mapped. But if I'm being honest, we don't really use that all that much because we're just used to, you know, mapping individual objects. Yeah. Um, so we're actually one hour and five minutes. Oh. And, um, yeah. <laughs> when I'm sorry, when... I, I talk so much. Not at all. Time not at all. Way uh, too fast. Last live stream for reference, we went like an hour and thirty minutes. Uh, sometimes, you know, if we feel like it, there. If we feel like there's something that is worth covering, like this uh, real world scale between those two modifiers, we definitely go there. Um, actually, Chemist Chemist asked a question about pixel depth nodes and so on in Unreal. So I'll just have a small segue before oh, sure. uh, you and I are going to close um, chop. So um, let me actually go back. Uh, let me tag him just in case he is watching. Check this out. OK, so um, a, a lot of people sometimes want to let me open that scene. Where do I have it? There you go. Oh no, got to compile my material. Yeah, people sometimes want to basically, maybe you have a rock and you have a terrain, you want to make them blend together um, or something like that. Um, if you're using Unreal, it's quite tricky in general. Uh, I think you have like three methods. The first one, which is the one that I'm going to show you, is fairly simple, quite effective in most basic cases, but quite you know, not the best thing out there. And it's called, um, what is it called again? Pixel depth offset uh, workflow. The other one I think uses a way more complex uh, method and I think is more expensive as well. And then you have another one which involves some weird tips and tricks uh, with, you know, like kind of tweaking the normals of your mesh and so on. So pretty complicated um, as well. Uh, let's just give it a second here for our shaders to compile. But meanwhile, I'll go to my 3D assets folder and I'll just show you this really neat trick in a second. Okay, so I have this asset right here. All right, looks like it's done. I have this asset right here. I'll just make it smaller and I'll put it in the ground. Now, if you look at the edges over here, you'll see that the transition is really harsh. Uh, don't mind the difference in resolution. This is pixel density being completely broken since I scaled this mesh. But uh, yeah, the transition is super harsh. And um, in the upcoming live link, actually, we have, let's wait for this to open up. We have this neat feature called de dither based object blending and this one will take its time to render but what it does basically is that it makes the 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 area where two meshes intersect smooth and then kind of applies a dithering uh, on that intersection giving you a fake smooth uh, transition it's cheap but you know it does uh, the job so let's just wait a second for it to render. And obviously, since you wanted to see the node while it's rendering. So this is all you have to do. Uh, this is the setup that we have. However, if you just apply here, you know, dither temporal, and then you add a multiply, and then you add this guy here, you can just give it a value of one or zero point whatever, or even six, you just, you know, this guy over here, this guy over there, and you plug it into the pixel depth offset, then you should be um, good to go. So the node setup is really simple, as you can see. Just don't use it on everything. Uh, yeah, this takes ages to compile. So let, just give me a second. Yes, albedo tinting is fairly simple. This is the setup that we have. You have an albedo, we're using a blend overlay. Uh, overlay intensity to control the intensity of the blend and then you have this color this allows us to tint it um, yes uh, basically um, looks like it's almost done so we should give the mic back to chop in a sec this is something that can be frustrating in offline <laughs> in real time it's just compiled time but uh, 
Yeah, I don't have a Chops computer, unfortunately, so <laughs> this is taking a little bit more time. You know, I, I feel like I'm going to go to your office one of these days, Chop, and just steer <laughs> You're it. welcome. <laughs> just gonna Always welcome, the whole man. Thing. All right, yeah, um, as you can see, the value, obviously, you know, I'm still tweaking it. That's why it's called Mad Dealer. <laughs> so I'll just set the value to 10. Uh, obviously, it's too much. If I set it to 4, as you can see, we have a software transition. Um, it kind of play, uh, destroys your mesh. I wouldn't say color, but like normal or something. Uh, so yeah, just be careful with how you tweak this value. But as you can see, it creates a really soft transition. And if you use it on smaller objects, it becomes really, uh, wait, the Unreal can be quite annoying. It becomes really neat, depending on how you use it. But yeah, again, um, just use it with caution. And uh, once we ship that update, you guys will have it. And uh, yeah, it's you're going to love it. So uh, before we close in, I think there was one last thing, uh, Chop, that you know, I just wanted to take want us to take maybe three or two minutes to go over before we end the live stream. And this is the uh, post processing, you know, like just yeah. a few tips and tricks here and there before we end up on this live stream. Right. OK. Yeah. Well, uh, post, like I said, you know, we don't generally do a lot of post outside of the frame buffer, but modern frame buffers have tons of options where you can like really do all sorts of crazy things so let me just stop this render right now and let's just go through these like super quickly so uh, basically all your images inside the render engine are obviously rendered linearly right so as hdrs basically from the inside and we have we need a way to kind of compress that in a way that we can look at it on the screen so uh first of all you know the exposure and stuff like that is just your average camera kind of thing so there's not much to it right but highlight compress is pretty cool because by default this render looks like this so these areas are kind of burnt and we really don't want that we want everything to be visible so sometimes you can crank the highlight compress up and it's going to tone right down but you don't want to overdo it because your images are going to end up looking flat. So that's sometimes a problem. And we kind of increase the contrast on this. So this is like the default and this is ours because we wanted, you know, this really atmospheric moody kind of image thing. So the filmic highlights and shadows are, well, that's not very simple to explain basically, but it's, mm, it's about tone mapping. So, the way you kind of change the colors of the original image towards what you want to end up with. And what the filmic shadows do is they kind of recover a bit, you know, of these darker areas. And also it's kind of sort of like provides some sort of micro contrast, right? But as with anything else, you don't really want to overdo it unless you know exactly what you're doing. And yeah, we added a vignette, which just kind of darkens the edges a bit more. So this is really nothing special, but uh, we also added a lot. So lookup tables are an awesome way to like super quickly color grade your image. And Corona actually comes with a ton of these uh, installed by default, which is really cool. And you can just, you know, scroll through them and get like these yeah crazy amounts of variations of looks i actually use them so, even in photoshop like corona has the best uh lot's out there it's just amazing <laughs> yeah i think these are all done by adam martin from spain who is uh an absolutely amazing artist so i think he provided most of these for corona i might be wrong but i think it was him but basically, yeah, you can, you can just quickly color grade your scene to a different look and you, you can, you know, use a slider to kind of control the influence. And lastly, we just added a bit of bloom, bloom and glare here because whenever you have like a very strong light in your scene that's visible directly without any bloom, it looks kind of ugly. You know, it really, I mean, this isn't even rendered to finish, but, you know, adding a bit of bloom is what would probably happen in the camera anyway it just kind of you know blends it a bit better with the with the surrounding right 
And that's pretty much it. You know, it's um, these very few options actually give you so much space to just have fun, you know, with your images and the way, you know, you're going to edit them. For most of these things, you, really, you don't really need Photoshop at all. You know, yeah. if you're not actually physically pasting something into your images, most of the stuff today you can just do in a frame buffer. So, yeah, and uh, actually, uh, I'm glad that you covered the bloom and glare part because we had someone asking about some tips and tricks on the glow effect in the frame buffer. But I guess that yeah. kind of well, answered that. The only the only tip I can give you is just don't overdo it. Yeah, uh, because you'll you'll find these images that look like this, or even worse, like uh, this. And that's when people, you know, the bloom and glare is fun, right? Everybody likes these glowing lights and stuff like that. But it's it's just, you know, you should try not to overdo it. And obviously, you know, bloom is one thing, glare is another. And I'm not a huge fan of glare, to be completely honest. I very rarely use it at all because it gives you these weird sparkles. I mean, that would kind of happen in photography, but not really like this. So... I tend to avoid it a lot because it, you know, sometimes it appears in the wrong places. So I find Bloom generally a much nicer and, you know, more aesthetically pleasing effect and easier to control as well. Yeah. And uh, just a quick um, tip here is that sometimes if you want to have a Bloom, like a lot of Bloom in certain areas, but not all over your picture, you can render two images one with extreme bloom and one without and then you just comp them in photoshop by masking the area the areas it's going to be dirty but hey if it looks good um uh, you get the job done with that so but um let me just check here yeah we actually the like the user the number of concurrent viewers has been just growing or being steady so it's always hard to leave uh, this late but I think we're done here I'll just answer some generic questions here uh, one guy said to you Chop thank you very much for the corona streaming really helpful um, oh you're welcome will there be a blender live stream someday definitely uh, you have no idea how much we're working to make sure that uh, we feature blender as much as possible because um, you know, it's an up and coming software and seriously, all the new features that they've been adding to it, seeing concept artists using it, seeing uh, hard surface artists, like so many people, people have been transitioning. And early on, to be honest, I thought it was just, you know, hype, like, hey, Blender, everyone's using it. I'm going to use it. But when I tried um, 2.8, that was probably the cleanest and best I wouldn't say modeling, I would say CG software that I tried so far, the buggiest one, but I mean, to be fair, it's still in beta. Uh, however, yeah, I'm, I'm still a Maya user, but yeah, it's an amazing software and we definitely will be covering it at some point. Um, okay, if I'm a character artist and I also create assets, how can I use Unreal? Where can I search information or courses for Unreal? How to okay I'll just go to art station here because I think I might know and um, so just go to art station character no not like that character UE4 and you're probably gonna see some amazing yeah there's a lot of really amazing artists that do amazing art and then they share tips and tricks sometimes breakdowns you know uh, how they did the colors maybe they have extra texture maps uh, and not just you know like a subsurface scattering map um, and sometimes they use like texturing xyz or something for details on the faces there's all all sorts of tips and tricks so i would say just check people's art and you're bound to found, find someone who made something amazing and who made a tutorial or a breakdown about it. Um, do check AT level as well. They always have information in there. And uh, yes, I think that should be it. Uh, last mention or reminder, uh, please check this, you know, Quixel art community group. There is a lot of artists posting, you know, stuff here. And as you can see, people are giving them feedback, like almost on every video here you have 
even the CEO of Quixel is there, sometimes giving you feedback, sometimes telling you this is amazing. <laughs> so yeah really great stuff all over uh, just go there if you have a problem or if you want to show us your amazing art or if you just want to grow as an artist go there come into the live streams ask all the questions you want and we'll do our best to make sure that you get the information uh, you need uh, will you guys do any challenges in the future definitely we want to make a challenge uh, a big one but uh, we're, it's in the works uh, let's say all right I think that should be it. Job, thank you so much for your time. Um, no, thank you for the invite. Yeah, and the, the mouse thing and so on was funky early on, but I think you did yeah. really great. So thanks a lot. And uh, thank you guys for viewing the live stream. And don't forget, I'll be at the um, SOA Academy event next week in Venice, Italy. If you want to go there, there's going to be two different workshops where I'll show you how to create that environment for a real time scene. So don't hesitate to say hi and ask all sorts of questions. And as always, Quixel is hiring and hiring. So, you know, if you happen to be there, we might also just talk about that as well. All right. Thanks a lot, guys. And uh, have a great weekend. Stay amazing. And yeah, talk to you soon. Bye. Bye.